Welcome everyone to the program of Hands-On FNIRS for Motor and Auditory Research. My name is Mariana Sassi and I will be your host for this lecture. This is the first lecture of a two-day program that provided an introduction to FNIRS. On the following lectures, you will learn about the functional near-infrared spectroscopy, auditory experimental design, motor experimental design, and FNIRS data processing and statistical analysis. This event was brought to you by the Santos Dumont Institute, the University of São Paulo, the Federal University of ABC, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, the State University of Campinas, Brain Support, and RX Medical Technologies. I would like to thank these institutions in the name of the professors Alexandre Moreira, Alexandre Ocano, Edgar Moria, João Sato, Maria Delia Aratanha, Rickson Mesquita, Sheila Balen, and Jackson Sionek, who organized this event. Here, we'll enjoy Alexander von Luma, Scientific Director of NARX Medical Technologies and Visiting Researcher at Boston University. Mr. Luma is an electrical engineer and data scientist specialized on processing, analysis, and classification of biosignals. He designs biomedical instrumentation and is currently the scientific director of NIREX Medical Technologies in Germany, as well as a visiting researcher at Boston University. Let us all welcome Mr. Luhmann. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know how many people are seeing this. Um, welcome from Germany. Um, I'm actually calling from, from home office, as you might be able to see some tools in the background. Um, let's use this. Uh, remain 35 minutes wisely. I will try to not go too fast and rather skip some things. So this talk uh, is called Components and FNIRS Neuroimaging Data. It has a kind of funny subtitle, The Brain, a Cocktail Party. I assume that most of you um, know about the cocktail party problem in uh, source separation. This is kind of what, what this is referring to. And the idea is to um, basically give a short, uh, well, yeah, short uh, overview of how um, typical blind source separation methods and, and you know, generally separation methods in neuroimaging data apply to FNIRS in particular. Um, my name is Alexander von Luhmann. I am not sure how I was introduced because I didn't hear it. I'm the research director of, um, of R&D uh, of NEREX. Um, and uh, since Mahde is with you, I think I don't have to introduce NEREX. I was formerly postdoc at David Boas's lab in Boston. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about, you can see in the top right here, is uh, partially uh, results from my research together with David at Boston, at Boston University and previously uh, at TU Berlin. So the contents of this talk, um, first I want to reintroduce or introduce for the first time for everyone who has not heard of it um, as to the cocktail party problem. Um, then I want to uh, we'll, we'll give a little introduction to the generative linear model um, and differentiate between two kinds of GLMs, let's say, a short intro to blind source separation or source separation in particular for FNIRS, um, many standard approaches, but trying to convey you know a bit more what what matters, but uh, particularly if you apply, for example, PCA or ICA or so in, uh, on FNIRS. And lastly, and I think this is probably what most people are interested in, is then how does it, how, why does this even matter? So how do we apply it, for example, in BCI and in neuroscience? So uh, a brief recap, um, in my work previously, I have worked with uh, EEG and FNUS uh, in hybrid setups and hybrid experiments. <clears throat> so um, we are mostly going to talk about FNUS, but um, many of these methods have before actually been explored in EEG. And so reminding us how EEG works uh, very briefly. So we have, uh, basically we are measuring um, the, the, the sum, sum activation of uh, millions and billions of, of um, uh, active synapses, basically, and the surface of the head. Um, the problem when measuring EEG non-invasively is that uh, we have volume conduction in the head. So basically, at different positions uh, measured on the scalp, we get an, an overlap, basically a summation of, of a lot of activity, and uh, the activity is highly correlated. So uh, for people who want to know what is actually going on in a particular area of the brain, it is very relevant to unmix the signals, unmix the data, and, and kind of um, go back to um, a localized activation. Uh, in FNIRS, I think I don't have to introduce too much uh, us into FNIRS, but in FNIRS, uh, we measure um, metabolic activation with near infrared light. Um, 
this is much more localized, luckily. However, we also have the problem that the signal consists of much more than the local activation in the brain. Um, it also has a lot of components in it that are of systemic origin or physiological origin that we pick up while the light is traveling, traveling through the tissue, um, going through skull, scalp, and, uh, and all those different tissue layers. Um, those layers add changes to the signal and, um, for example, systemic fluctuations. Um, and those we, uh, we need to also kind of separate. And so basically there's always a similar problem that I think we are all aware of, and that is how do we get to the content in, this, in these signals that is actually of interest to us? So one way, and by far not the only one, but I think it's a nice way to introducing this is, uh, is the cocktail party problem. The cocktail party problem is a um, typical example that is usually used also in academia to introduce to the uh, idea of independent component analysis and just you know, for, for to remind us what this usually is. So in this cocktail party problem, we have a room full of people in a cocktail party and all of those um, are conversing. So they're all talking to each other. We have single individuals um, speaking but if we put uh, at least the same number of microphones uh, into this room that we have speakers, uh, we can try to disentangle the summed up information. So any micro microphone in the room will get a lot of noise, a lot of voices overlapping. And now the question is, can we do something to get back to the individual speaker? Um, and uh, that is basically the cocktail party problem. So usually I have a sound file here that I assume <laughs> it doesn't make sense to play because in my computer you don't seem to get my uh, microphone or any audio input. So well, uh, imagine you have a room full of people talking. Uh, on the left side, we have the individual speakers. Um, in the middle, we have the mix, let's say, of voices. Then we have at least the same number of microphones as we have speakers. And each microphone measures a mixture of all those uh, sad things and all the audio basically in the room. Um, but they all, do all measure different um, weighted um, sums of these individual speakers. But that's the cocktail party problem. And um, this, you know, obviously somehow it translates to the problem of having uh, neuroimaging data that we want to disentangle. If we now imagine that we have different um, areas of the brain or different neurons or different groups of neurons uh, all talking, basically, uh, can we, if we measure the, uh, the summed up information, can we somehow get the individual uh, information out of it? The FNIR signal. Um, just to remind us, I will have two slides, or actually three, that uh, will focus on this now. Um, I know this is probably known to everyone, but uh, the extent is very important. What you see here in this slide is um, standard FNIS channels from one of the early papers, from, so early papers from David Boas. What you see in green are typical um, FNIS channels, and uh, you can see that there's a cardiac um, cycle and you have slow uh, oscillations. And so basically, what we know now is um, a lot, but not the actual neuron, neuronal activation. And that becomes even more clear when you look at simultaneously measured respiration and blood pressure signals. You can see that there's quite some correlation and quite some similarities, and both respiration and blood pressure are not directly representing brain activity, of course. So FNRS signals have many more components than just brain activation. Um, typical ones are vasomotor or low frequency waves, also called Maya waves, um, respiration. So this is now modeled and highly simplified but respiration effects on vasculature in the area of 0.2 Hertz. Um, cardiac cycles around one beat per minute, uh, per beat per second, so 60, 60 beats per, per minute, roughly. So that's a one Hertz sound wave. Then we have measurement noise from the instrument. And we have motion artifact and other things. Um, and then we have the functional signal that we're actually interested in. And all of these add up to our FNIR signal. And you can see I put these little humans here. So again, these are different speakers. We are measuring with our microphone the overlapping information of all of those. Different way of looking at this, but the same information, um, just you know, from the other angle. Uh, we have understood by now quite well how the hemodynamic response uh, is made up, basically what functions and what physiology in the brain and in the vasculature create this uh, typical HRF that we're expecting in uh, after a stimulus in, in like oxy and oxy hemoglobin. But again, if uh, we look at uh, what we measure and what is there, uh, this is just Part of it, and if you, you know, also now, it's, so basically the typical FNU signal is this long separation signal here on the bottom. But if we measure other signals simultaneously on the body and around the body, we can see that there's a lot of stuff going on that is quite similar. So the short separation signal that contains uh, information that is 
uh, only in the scalp and not in the brain, um, respiration, blood pressure, PPG. So basically the same information uh, than in the slide before. And I'm just repeating this because um, it is very important to keep this in mind in FNIR's analysis. And much of the methods and basically everything that we're going to discuss in the following evolve around this problem. Um, how do we get back to our HRF and suppress everything else? Okay, so ways to model this um, so far usually are based on linear models. Um, and so uh, the typical linear model is the generative linear mixing model um, that I will now briefly introduce to everyone. So we have our cocktail party problem. If you want to formalize this into a uh, linear mixing model and a generative linear mixing model, then one way of doing this is as follows. Um, we uh, we name every source uh, with, with S as one until as N. So we have a source matrix here that is um, time points by a number of sources. Um, we have our observations uh, or recordings or FNews channels um, that we you know with X with the same dimension. And then we have a linear square mixing matrix that mixes sources with certain weights. And those weights are typically unknown into observations and vice versa. And so, um, if you now look at the direction of going from source to observation, so from brain activation, or local brain activation to the recording, which is our FNUS, for example, FNUS channel, then this is called forward model. Um, so the observation is the result of the, this uh, pattern matrix, this mixing matrix multiplied with our source matrix. Um, typically, though, because we have X already, we are actually interested in, uh, in the other direction, that is the backward model. So we want to estimate that's why we have this little hat here. We want to estimate the source activation from the observed FNUS data or EG data, for example. And we need you know, some filter matrix, some extraction filter W to uh, to get to this estimate. And the problem is that both S and W are, un are unknown. So um, again, same um, same uh, motivation as before, but now with this formalized version. So we have uh, quite some FNUS channels here. This is a typical signal that we might measure that has different um, influencing factors here. So we can, might have opto shifts leading to some um, level change. And we have some regular activation, low frequency oscillation, but also some activation. And then we might have slow movement artifacts that come from body activation and that are in the same band of interest, um, but are not brain. And so the question is, of course, what can we do to get to our HRF? And in this linear mixing model uh, approach. The idea is to try to get into the source space to um, kind of disentangle these components, use all the channels, use all the information we have, and uh, identify now here, for example, in yellow, uh, a source or several sources that represent uh, motion um, in, in, um, or components that are influenced by motion. And we have cardiac, then we have low frequency, and then maybe we have the actual HRF. So this is obviously under ideal circumstances, will never work like this. 100%, but that's the whole idea behind this approach. So um, specifically about these slow motion artifacts, uh, I'm kind of pointing to a paper here that is, uh, let's say, rather theoretical, but that deals with a lot of this um, mixing models and, and uh, different ways of unmixing uh, ethnic data. And I'm going to talk a bit about this now. But um, one last iteration. So uh, this is now EEG, of course. But again, in EEG, this, this certainly applies and is very well known. So um, we have our um, observation matrix X. So we have time by number of channels. Um, the linear generative forward model now assumes that the data is the sum of sources, N sources and components um, that are mixed with, uh, with A, with our pattern A. And uh, if uh, we use look at EEG, uh, such a pattern would look like the scalp plot um, that basically weighs all the electrodes. If you look at fMRI and FNIRS, that is a bit more abstract because we don't have that kind of pattern. But basically, you always have a, um, a, weight, a weight of multiple channels or sources um, multiplied with the time course. And as I said initially, um, we're interested in mostly this um, backward model uh, because we want to estimate the, uh, the sources. So um, the question is, how do you find this spatial extraction filter W that um, gets us the source. We don't know the source. We don't know W. We know X. And obviously, since this is kind of ill-determined, the question is what uh, what um, assumptions do we make about the data to find this spatial extraction for the W? So I will make a differentiation, and this is very important. This is kind of the first main point of this talk. Um, 
Um, that was something that actually confused me personally greatly while I was doing my PhD. Um, general linear mixing model, the general, general linear model in FNIRS, is this the same? What is it actually? So I'm going to now jump to the general linear model and then I will kind of explain or you know make very clear the differentiation where they are the same. So the GLM in FNIRS, the way that we know it, uh, the way it's implemented, for example, in Homer and many other toolboxes, um, we, uh, we, we, okay, we do the following, and I will afterwards kind of um, bring over both of this together. So we have our FNIRS signal, and we try to we try to generate, we try to construct this FNIRS signal, explain this FNIRS signal, signal by several components or regressors that have a certain weight, and this weight is in the GLM, typically called beta. So we have a drift regressor, linear drifts, or, or, or other you know, higher polynomial order drifts. We have a short separation uh, signals that we typically use to uh, model uh, as a regressor to model the physiology in the signal. And then we have representations of the hemodynamic response function, so like a Gaussian, for example, a canonical HRF. And so uh, assuming that these are all in there, we now try to find the weights. So. Um, this is the typical GLM, and I will now explain how this kind of relates to what I said before. Um, but in this cocktail party uh, understanding again, we basically assume we know the different speakers. We just don't know how loud they speak. So basically how, how loud each speaker um, kind of gets mixed into the overall observation. Um, and that is fundamentally something else than what I just said before. So there we usually don't have S or S hat. We don't know the sources. And we just want to know the sources and the filter. Here we're actually interested in the weights. And we assume that we know um, the um, at least the temporal um, kind of pattern of the of the sources. So, and this is kind of where we will have another slide on this. But this is one of the kind of key takeaways I just wanted to uh, kind of present today um, for everybody who's not aware of it. So the general linear model in FNIRS is a special case of the generative linear mixing model. And how that comes is basically I'm gonna I'm gonna explain in a bit, but it's basically it's like saying every dog, not every dog is a what is it, sausage sausage dog or, or Schäferhund or so, um, but uh, but every you know specific race is a is a is a dog, so um, it's a it's kind of a subset. So how does the GLM, the general linear model in FNUS, typically uh, work, um, specifically with short separation regression, which is let's say the kind of gold standard uh, that, that people use in neuroscience. So we have um, normal long separation channels. We have short separation channels. We use these as regressors. We also use, um, we know, we assume we know the, the onset of stimuli. So that is kind of where we, we put this in, in the model. We have regressor templates. Um, and I'm going to explain now a bit how this is put together. Um, we have drifts that we model. And then uh, we try to find beta to get basically an estimate for an, or a response. And so the um, observed ethnic signal sorry, this is a, this is slightly um, shifted. So basically, this uh, this box here, I hope you see my mouse, is is supposed to point at the observed ethnic signal. So we model this signal as a functional, a physiological, a drift component, and a noise component. So this is the observed signal. Sorry, this is from here, um, and we now try to yeah kind of get back. And so uh, what we do in the GLM is we actually construct this design matrix G and G contains all the information, all the regressors that we claim we know. And the only thing that we're then trying to find is beta, uh, the beta values that kind of weigh this. And so how this typically works, um, so we have uh, our physiology is modeled as um, sum of weighted um, short channels, usually at least one, you know, sometimes more or something uh, similar. Um, the hemodynamic response function can be modeled in many very uh, different ways, uh, either a canonical fixed shape or multiple Gaussians. So this is what uh, is described formalized here. We say we have the sum of several, basically, um, the function activations, the sum of several HRFs, basically, here that are modeled by uh, Gaussians that have a certain um, so multiple Gaussians that are overlapping and they have a certain um, offset uh, in time. So for example, half a second. And then we are trying to model this overall shape of the Gaussian uh, of the HRF by um, just scaling the individual Gaussians. So we get a shape that kind of matches, um, matches the HRF best. And so we put all this in here. So what you see here is we have M regressors, T time points, these lines here. If you would look at one or, you know, one column here, you have basically um, one Gaussian um, at the beginning of a, of a stimulus, for example, then at the next stimulus, another one, and then 
basically the next column shows you the second Gaussian for the same HRF for each stimulus. So basically, we have Gaussians wandering over time here, and uh, we're trying to find um, for each column we find one beta value, and uh, and that basically uses then all the data, all the information that is in the data um, simultaneously. Um, this is usually done and solved by a, a linear least squares approach, and I think probably um, yeah I don't know how much yeah, the background of the, of the group here is. I don't want to get lost in the details, but this is basically the standard approach. So what's the difference between what I originally um, explained and what I now just talked about? So um, this is a, quite some text, but let's just go over this. We were talking initially about observations X, um, patterns A and sources S, and now in the GLN for F years, we were talking, or at least I didn't say it, but you, see, you could see it, about a you know, typically a Y for the observation, a beta and an X. Slightly, slightly confusing maybe, and that's just because of the, um, the convention. But in the end, it's both the same. So we have a linear mixing model. We just have a linear combination of, of time courses, basically, that explain our data. Um, and the difference is that, that in a, basically, the difference, the point is just that every GLM is a generative linear mixing model, but not the other way around. And um, our uh, measured FNS signal Y um, is explained in the GLM by, uh, by, by um, assuming we know the regressors when we find the beta values, and that it would be called a supervised approach. In this case, we know the uh, stimulus onsets, we know the experiment, we, we basically assume we know the uh, regressors, and the only thing we want to know is the weights. And if you look at unsupervised decomposition, in which we don't really know anything, then you would go into the more abstract, you know, generative linear mixing model, in which we just say we have observations, we have sources, and we have some mixing um, matrix cuts and patterns. Okay, now because of the time and my kind of late onset in this talk, I will go over this rather quickly because I assume that everyone has basically heard about PCA, ICA, and so on already um, uh, throughout, you know, somewhere in your career or studies. Um, but I want to briefly kind of relate how this matters for engineers. So. Very quickly, um, what I just already mentioned, we usually interest in the backward model. Uh, if we do source separation and if we do blind source separation, then this means that we are in an unsupervised supervised case. Um, so unsupervised means we don't have labels, we don't have ground truth. Um, typical unsupervised methods would be PCA, or ICA, uh, briefly saying PCA maximizes variance and orthogonality of sources, ICA statistical independence and CCA, which is canonical correlation analysis, um, uh, looks at two data sets. And we're going to go very briefly into each of these in, in the following slides. So this is these are unsupervised or blind source separation approaches. And then if you actually do supervised analysis and, for example, a brain-computer interfaces, then you have methods that like CSP, common spatial pattern analysis and EEG, or LDA, linear discriminant analysis. And those are um, then usually used for feature extraction or classification. So here we have labels um, that that help us to unmix the data, and so the um, the the topic that we're looking into a bit more now is the unsupervised um, uh, approach. So uh, PCA uh, again, I'm going quickly over this now, but PCA I think we most of us probably know. So we're looking at data that uh, we try to. Um, uh, reduce the dimensionality of, or at least identify the directions with the highest variance. So uh, in this data, with two-dimensional data, we would have a first principal component in this direction, the second one orthogonal to this. In FNIRS, PCA is um, usually used or interesting to reduce systemic confounding nuisance signals. So there's a kind of highly cited paper from Zhang, 2005, where they, uh, where they initially proposed this, and that can be used if you use all your FNIRS channels, you do a PCA and you get the first principal component. The assumption is that that represents your systemic physiology that is kind of more or less um, available on all the signal channels. And then you can kind of, for example, use that as a regressor and, and remove it. There's also other interesting approaches. PCA is used really all across data science. I just wanted to briefly, whoever doesn't know eigenfaces, uh, just Google this. It's pretty cool. Um, you can use it on images, the PCA, and with eigenfaces, you get something very um, intuitive, very cool. And it's actually also counterintuitive, but you know, the first principal component of a face would potentially look like this, for example, on this data set. Um, but yeah, due to time constraints, we'll skip this. 
I see a independent component analysis. There's many ways of solving this problem. It's uh, not as easy to solve as a PCA, which is uh, basically a generalized eigenvalue problem. Um, in ICA, uh, we need to, for example, uh, reduce or minimize mutual information. Um, how we formalize this, we will not go into detail right now. The one thing that I want to point out here, and we'll have another slide on this, is that uh, so ICA is very famous in EEG, especially when you have many uh, channels. You use it, for example, for um, suppression of I, uh, EOG artifacts or EMG artifacts, so muscle. In FNIRS, uh, ICA has not been used so much, and I started looking, I mean, it has been used, but um, usually with different uh, targets or goals and, and when I was looking into this. So um, I want to briefly go into this. Uh, in, in the literature, when I started looking at this, uh, ICA was typically said it underperforms when you compare to PCA. Um, and there's uh, there's very good reasons for that. And the main message here, also because of time that I will make short, is ICA is not equal to ICA. There's so many ICA approaches, and um, there are the assumptions um, that are made in the decomposition of signals to find those independent components can be very different. And so the ICA that I work with um, is a very powerful one um, from um, UNBC in Baltimore, from Tula Adali's group, it's called Entropy Rate Bound Minimization. And that ICA um, takes into consideration much more a mathematical, um, well, let's say, in the data, statistics in the data that are actually um, relevant for FNIR. So we have sample dependence, um, potentially multiple Gaussian sources. Usually ICA assumes that every component is non-Gaussian. Um, we have we can deal with source dependencies a bit better. So how does this show? So what you see up here is uh, toy data, and below you see real FNIR data that I uh, decomposed in, in, in the two sources. Uh, you see my you know, real toy data. We have some HRFs that I modeled. We have some noise. We have some cardiac, some respiration, and so on. And if you use fast ICA or ERBM, fast ICA is a very famous, widely used ICA, uh, we can see that the um, result in the decomposition varies greatly. And you can see that with ERBM, um, we get much, much better reconstruction of the true sources. Um, and uh, that is basically the main uh, a main message here, um, not being able to go into too much detail, is um, if you want to use ICA and FNIRS, be very aware that you need to understand kind of what is the assumption in the ICA that you apply, and that the performance can vary greatly depending on the assumptions. So what you see below here is uh, real FNIRS data from an experiment I will very briefly show um, in the next few minutes. It's the same experiment I've shown for years. Um, <laughs> Um, because it was a, one of the first data sets I got my hands on where we had motion and FNIRS and EG measured simultaneously. These lines are basically um, button presses and um, you can see basically these peaks here are motion artifacts. And the goal was if we do ERBM on our FNIRS data set, maybe we can, can find components that represent motion artifacts and the other components, for example, here, Mayo waves and cardiac. And then we can separate this very nicely. So this doesn't work as beautifully always as, as this, but um, the tendency is very clear. Okay, canonical correlation analysis, also very quickly, um, I'm trying to get kind of the high level overview um, so people can work into this if they are interested. So a canonical correlation analysis is special in the sense that it usually connects two multivariate data sets. So um, in an example that I just gave in this experiment in which there's a lot of motion, um, we measured accelerometer, uh, accelerometer and FNIRS, and the question is then, can you decompose the FNIRS data uh, and find those components that correlate very strongly with the accelerometer? And then you assume that is FNIRS components that are motion-related and not of neuronal origin. So uh, this is the optimization function. W are the individual uh, extraction filters that we need to find. X and Z are the data sets that we have, for example, FNIRS. Uh, data and an accelerometer data. And uh, this is actually, again, a generalized eigenvalue problem that is rather easy to, to solve. So in this example that I just gave, just to in, give a better intuition, um, CCA um, can work like this. So what you see here is low-pass filtered FNIS data, raw intensity data from this experiment that I just mentioned. We have multiple um, motion events, people, you know, bending down, stretching, pressing buttons. You can see, or you, you know, during the experiment, you could already tell, and here you just believe me, but you can see that every motion would have some effect that creates quite a high dip or, you know, a peak or valley in the FNUS data that we would obviously like to suppress. And um, now if 
I show you the accelerometer data that we acquired simultaneously, you can also tell that there's certainly some uh, some interrelation. Um, but you can also see that it's not uh, directly on top of each other. So if we look at the onset or the peak delay between these peaks here, we can see that they're not, uh, first of all, they're not on top of each other, but also there's a delta that can differ. And so there, that is what we would call non-instantaneous and, uh, and non-constant coupling. So if you would do CCA now, this is a, basically a perfect uh, method to relate those two data sets, then that's good, but it's, it's not going to work very well because if these data are not perfectly aligned, uh, then, uh, you know, obviously uh, the, the, the morphology basically doesn't match so well. So to deal with these delays, there's a trick that is called temporal embedding uh, or TCCA. Uh, that basically means we use this one data set and we just add time shifted copies. Um, to this data set, and then we run TCCA, we run CCA on this original data and the time shifted data to basically match uh, those delays. That means that in the source space, we will get components that basically represent very well both data sets. So that was uh, probably way too fast, but an um, overview of uh, three main blind source separation approaches that, in my opinion, are quite relevant for FNUs that um, can be used to various degrees. and. This slide now just summarizes the challenges, and that is very important. Um, so FNIR signals are very challenging uh, if you want to decompose them well with PCA, ICA, or SDCA for the following reasons. We have localized and global um, components or you know signals and artifacts in our FNIR channels. So if you have your heart rate, for example, a heartbeat is a global signal, let's say a systemic signal that mixes into the FNIR channels, but very differently depending on vasculature, might have different delays and amplitudes. We have non-instantaneous, non-constant and non-linear coupling. And why I put the non-linear in bold here is because clearly this violates the assumption of a linear mixing model. So. Um, the question is always, you know, how, how much does it hurt us to ignore that? But that's why I'm just pointing this out. Um, physiological noise is colored. So what that means is, is there is sample dependency. It's not white noise, but it's, for example, pink noise or so. And there's sample dependency, which also means that ICA, um, if you use ERBM ICA, um, that takes sample dependency into, into consideration. That is one of the reasons why this approach works much better or can work much better. And then there might be dependencies between sources. And of course, if you assume independence, then this makes it a bit more tricky. So again, an, uh, an example in, in FNIRS is we know that um, respiration um, modulates also the cardiac signal in the FNIRS, so just the amplitude. And so there's clearly no, those two, let's say, otherwise potentially independent signals are not independent. Also physiologically, they're not really independent. But um, so that is kind of important to take into consideration. There are two papers I want to recommend. Um, one is from Ted Huppert in 2016 in Neurophotonics uh, on the statistical properties of noise in FNIRS. Um, so there he talks a lot about also um, yeah, different kind of um, ways of modeling this and, and dealing with this. And then um, we have a rather recent paper um, from Dominic Weiser and Felix Schultzmann uh, and Martin Wolf's group in ETH Zurich that is dealing with or making the statement that short channels, if you measure them um, on the head, uh, it, one channel doesn't cover it all, but it's actually quite a heter heterogeneous. So if you have four or six or more short channels, they do measure different, let's say, components, and they might uh, they might be all important if you want to do short channel regression. Okay, mm. so to stop and Unfortunately, uh, there will be very basically no time for questions, I assume. I'm sorry for the delay in the beginning. I want to just put all of this together. Um, it will have to be quick, so I will skip some things um, to, to show how, in my case, for example, how I use some of these methods in uh, evidence based passive PCI and how they can be used in neuroscience and very general neuroscience approaches as well. So an experiment that I just mentioned before that I show very often, I will go very quickly over this. Um, in short, deals with mental workload um, in freely moving subjects. Um, back then, this data set was recorded with my self-built uh, hybrid EG FNIRS uh, headgear that is called M3DA. It doesn't really matter because by now there's uh, hardware like, for example, the Neuric systems, of course, also others that allow you to do mobile measurements that also enable you to measure acceler uh, accelerometer signals on the head. And um, so with any of such systems, you can 
and repeat an experiment like this. I'm just briefly showing you the video. I will not explain you the paradigm because of the time. But what is relevant is just that in this, in this you know, two times accelerated video, you see a participant pressing buttons. Um, he basically does a spatial end back task, trying to remember certain colors, um, pressing buttons uh, if uh, a certain condition is met. And you can see that he's moving quite a lot, bending down, stretching up. And that is, of course, um, a nightmare for the signals. And so what you see here, this is something I showed before, is basically from this data set. So uh, every gray line is a button press event or a start or a stop of the trial event. And you can see here in the accelerometer signals how these and then delayed in F years um, show you know, peaks and valleys. And so the question is, what can we do about this? Because obviously, if we don't do anything, this near signals will not be robust. It will not be very helpful to do what we wanted to do, and that is to classify the mental workload. So to basically um, uh, classify, I'm just getting a message from Mari. I do not hear anything yet. No, I'm sorry. Um, I will be okay. I will be. I will be very quick now because <laughs> the time is not enough. Um, we'll skip this. If you want to learn more about Blizzard, that's kind of a framework that combines all these blinds of separation methods I, I mentioned. You can read it up. It's on your image um, in 2019. I'm the first author there. So if you want to find it, you know how to. Um, just to show you, we were able to reject these these big peaks and valleys quite strongly in our uh, in the Efner's data, which then helped us to do the. Uh, classification that I just wanted to briefly show to motivate. So we used uh, FNUS accelerometer and EG data. We uh, rejected hemodynamic motion artifacts with a blizzard approach, the typical feature extraction. That's not very special. In EG, I'm just going to skip this here. Uh, we did kind of some other appropriate measures and then ran a tenfold cross-validation based um, classification pipeline with regularized LDA. And what you see here now are the results. Um, maybe because of the time, just look at the numbers. So we discriminated zero versus one, two, three back. So basically baseline task versus every, anything that might require mental effort. One versus three, which is basically low versus high workload and resting state versus high. And uh, with FNUS and EG and FNUS, we got a classification accuracies between 80 to almost 90% on the group average with 94% significantly better than chance. So in all in all, in, all in, in quite um, challenging data, and that is why uh, I wanted to show this. Uh, this is all based on lines of separation. So I'm going to stop now. Um, I'm going to just show you <laughs> that there is another method that also uses these lines of separation approaches in a supervised approach in the GLM, general linear model, that probably all of you know. And again, if you want to learn more, uh, this is something we, uh, we published together with David Bors's group. This method is implemented in Homer. It uses regressors that are more optimal than just short channel. Um, short channels to um, separate components in the data. So um, I'm sorry for the hurry in the end, just a very pretty special thanks. So those are the groups that were all somehow involved in the work that I presented here. David's lab uh, at Boston University, UMBC for ERBM, PTP with the M3BA units that I built and then in TU Berlin, Klaus Button 11 in Glasgow. That was a very fast run, I assume. I still don't hear anyone. Um, I think we have one minute left. Um, if there are any questions and there's ways to convey these to me, I'm very happy. Okay, so the first question is by Sadie Onamini, uh, who is a master's student in neuroengineering here at the Santos Dumont Institute. He asks, for a beginner in FNIR signal analysis, when a blind source separation is applied, what do you recommend to identify each source as corresponding to a respective physiological signal? Mm, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but I will try to address it. So I think the point here is that the, the answer is that you usually won't be lucky enough. You won't be as lucky uh, as um, you know being able to do this. So if you do some source separation, you will not usually be able to, um, you know, you usually get the same number of sources than you had channels. And let's say you did a measurement with 32 channels of FNUS data, you will get 32 sources. It will not be that you have one source that is only cardiac and one source that is only mayor waves and some, and the other sources will all be kind of simply brain. Um, it will not be that simple. Um, but it can be that you find sources that basically carry the majority of, of certain kind of information. So my, my statement here would be, is, you know, generally as a beginner, but for everyone, when you do source separation in FNIS, you want to do something else after you did the source separation. So in source space, 
for example, you want to look at how at the frequency spectrum to identify um, whether this source maybe only or mainly contains this peak, you know, in the frequency spectrum around the cardiac uh, um, uh, frequency of, you know, one hertz or so. And if that's the case, then maybe you say, okay, my assumption is that this source represents mostly or only cardiac, and if I want to reject it, I can kind of throw it out and do back projection without it, and I have reduced the impact of my cardiac signal. But um, this 100% clean separation will not be, uh, usually will not be that easy, and that's why there's some more things you have to do about it. Um, but it might help you because, um, well, with, with heart rate, it's easy. You can just go pass filter your data and it's gone. But especially when you're look, looking into components that are in the same frequency band like the HRF, breathing can be in there, you know, slow motion can be in there. It will be basically impo impossible otherwise to even get your hands on those fragments of components. Um, so, uh, yeah, sorry, because of the time, I will just leave it as, at that. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Armando Afonso Jr. He asks, how can you choose how many components will be removed after PCA, making sure no significant data will be lost? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and and again, I mean, so I think there are different things there. there. There's best practice approaches, but then there's also, it is quite a new field, let's say, um, not so many data scientists, I think, have spent so much time on, on this. In general, um, if you do PCA, you can, of course, say, uh, you know, you, you want to remove X percent of variance in the data. Um, we know that the HRF is usually around, you know, 1% of the, of the overall intensity level and roughly in the same order of magnitude and the heart rate. I can briefly tell you what I did in the blizzard um, approach that I had to fly over very quickly. What we did there is this. Um, in the end, we used CCA. CCA orders components in, uh, in a descending order, basically. So you have accelerometer and FNERS, and, uh, and the, it orders it with correlation. So what I did is, for example, I used a correlation threshold, and I said, if, there, if, I, if I want to be really strict, um, and I want to only throw out components that I'm quite certain are really only due to motion, I require very high correlation. So I use a correlation of greater than 95, uh, sorry, 0 0.95, or, you know, almost one. Uh, and you can find those components and you throw it out and then, you know, the confidence is rather high that you're not throwing out too much else. Um, but there's no, there's no general answer, you know, uh, because it really depends on the, on the application. It really depends on your use case. Um, much. And now for our last question, we have uh, Leonardo de Castro who asked, what movement variables do you usually collect alongside the FNIRS? Thank you. Yeah. So um, the, the very short experiment that I showed only used accelerometer, which was rigid, rigidly coupled to the head. So the idea there was that Basically, I want to at least capture all the head movement, movement. And this was only accelerometer. It was not a gyroscope. It was not an IMU chip with nine dimensions or so, but just 3D accelerometer, which was already super helpful. So um, the uh, paper that uh, that we published um, in 2020 on the GLM TCCA extension basically concluded that accelerometer and short channels, which are not capturing motion, but capturing artifacts as well, uh, are explaining most of the of the variance due to you know external circumstances. If you if you measure motion of the head, um, you should just make sure that the optodes basically that measure the signal and the uh, accelerometer or the motion sensor are rigidly coupled so that they cannot you know move independently. If your accelerometer dangles around and your atmosphere channels don't, obviously there will be less strong of a, of a um, connection between both. Um, there are also now approaches that do, uh, let's say, motion tracking with, you know, with IMUs at, at joints, but that combining that with FNIRS will be I think, a bit more complicated. You kind of need to model basically the body movement. So in short, um, if you can use a 6D IMU, maybe gyroscope and accelerometer, um, put it somewhere on the head or you use an accelerometer, like for example, the NSP2 has one um, that, you, that you can plug in. Um, that should usually be already quite good. Thank you so much for your time and for the very interesting lecture, Mr. Luhmann. This was the first of six lectures that are part of the program of hands-on FNIRS for modern auditory research. 
to see the other lectures, please access the YouTube channel of the Santos Dumont Institute at the playlist of the program of Hands-on Years for More on Auditorial Research. Subscribe to our channel and we'll see you at the next lecture. Thank you.